Okay, we've taken a look at this question about was there a Big Bang? Was the universe in a hotter and denser state in the past? And of course, our observational evidence seems to suggest that that's the case. Now, of course, underlying this picture that we have of the universe is its expansion, the fact that it's expanding, that space expands. I think we need to take a little bit of a look at what we mean when we say space expands. So when cosmologists think about the Big Bang, and it's not easy thing, uh, not an easy thing to think about, but what they're not thinking of is a bomb in empty space and the fuse goes down and everything blows itself to smithereens and we are the shrapnel that comes out of that. That's not the picture. The picture is grounded in Einstein's ideas. Uh, so Einstein said basically that uh, gravity itself is just the distortion of space-time, that as the stuff in space and time move around, they distort the geometry of space-time. So space can do all kinds of funky things, including expanding. It's, um, as you know, we've done a lot of public talks, and this, this question about uh, the universe around us and why one side is not expanding faster than the other, because everyone has this picture of this exploding bomb. Yeah. And, of course, cosmologists really haven't helped the situation over the years. Even the great cosmologist Lamartra, one of the key founders of what is our modern ideas of how the universe has evolved from early times, had this picture called the primeval atom or the cosmic egg that somehow split a past and give birth to the universe. So, so you can understand why people see this notion of something exploding from something smaller. Well, one of the problems is we're trying to think about all of space and time. And it's really hard to do that without trying to get a picture which is of something in our experience. And our experience is in space and time, not of space and time on that level. So it's a bit hard. The, the best we can do are, are pictures like the surface of a balloon. So the idea is the surface of a balloon, which is two-dimensional, represents the whole of three-dimensional space. And as it expands, everywhere on the balloon gets away from everywhere else on the balloon. But, but as you know, I mean, we, we present these kind of analogies to our classes. And it's very hard to talk to people about the surface of a balloon without them thinking about the outside and the inside of the balloon, not just the surface. So what what is it that we're supposed to tell people? What What is this expansion into? Right, so here's the problem. We're trying to talk about the whole of space and time. If space was expanding into something, that thing would have to be more space, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? I mean, if space itself is expanding, it can't expand into space because that just... Yeah, it's space itself that's supposed to be expanding. So the, the picture we have is that you have to try and imagine that the whole of space and time is represented by the surface of the balloon. And unfortunately, because we're in space and time ourselves, balloons have insides and outsides. But try to sort of abstract away from that, which is what the mathematics helps us do. But just think about the surface... And then that will represent the whole of space and time. Yeah. So, again, we've looked at the maths and we, we, we know uh, when you write down the equations for the universe that you have, you have to talk about coordinates, where things are and when they are. And there are three spatial coordinates we talk about, up, down, uh, left, right, top, bottom, etc. Um, and uh, there are no extra coordinates in which space time can expand into. I mean, mm. everything is contained in those equations and there's no extra bits for, you know, the expansion takes place in this direction or that direction. Yeah, so there's a complete list, if you like, mathematically, of all the places there are. And you can put a galaxy at this place and a galaxy at that place and they will move away from each other. But there's no extra place which is the outside, no extra place which is the inside. So one of the weird things about it is, if the universe is finite in volume, in the same way that the surface of a balloon is finite in volume... In area. In area, thank you. Uh, there's more volume in the universe today than there was yesterday. So you could literally fit more oranges into the universe today than yesterday because there's literally more space. So if the universe is finite, it wouldn't have an edge in the same way that the surface of the balloon doesn't have an edge. A little ant can't walk off the surface... But in the same way, our universe could have a finite volume. That volume gets bigger with time. Everything moves away from everything else. But there's still no outside. Yeah. Except there is an interesting point here, right? There's that one of the things that we know from our recent observations is that it doesn't look like we live in a universe that has mm. this finite volume. We live in a universe that appears to have an infinite volume. Mm. How does that make you feel? 
Yeah, that just makes things even harder. We're trying to imagine all of space time. All right, now make it infinitely large. Oh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> if the universe has an infinite volume, then what we can't say is there's more space yesterday than there's more space today than there was yesterday, because the the answer is infinite today, infinite yesterday. But what we can imagine is all right, just take the balloon and blow it up really, really big. Like the analogy here would be like when I think of my backyard, I don't care about the curvature of the Earth. I can just consider that to be flat. So just think about our little bit of space time as a small bit of the balloon. And then it behaves in the same way. Everything just gets further away from everything else. Perhaps you can instead imagine an infinitely large sheet of rubber and you could still make it expand in the way that everything on the sheet would still get further away from everything else. There's an interesting consequence here, though, isn't there? Right? As you said, it, if the universe is infinite, right? If it's infinite today, it'll be infinite tomorrow. It was infinite yesterday, but it was infinite a year ago, mm. a thousand years ago, a billion years ago. And as far back as we could push the history of the universe using our equations, it was infinite, which means that it was born infinite. Yeah, so the weird thing is, if the universe is finite in size... You can say, how big was it today? And there's a certain number, right? There's a certain number of cubic meters. As you go back in time, you go back to the time when the universe was half the size, then because you squeeze on all three directions, it's an eighth of the volume. And so when you want to calculate the size of the universe, you take the volume times how big the universe is relatively, and you can sort of work it out. The universe is infinitely large, and you push back to really early times. There's a time when that scale size of the universe goes to zero, in our models at least at the beginning. Right? That's what we call the beginning of the universe. More on that later. If you want to know the size of the universe, then you get into real trouble because it would be infinity times zero, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Right? At that point, you say, oh boy, I hope a different theory comes along and tells me what that's supposed to mean. Yeah, this could be a good place to wrap up because I think that's going to be a bigger question we need to ask is basically, where did the universe come from? <laughs>